name is Steve Sutterby. Steve is past president of the World War I Historical Association, also a two-time winner of the League's Hooper Award. He and his father, Alan, have published the English translation of René Martel's 1939 history of French aerial bombing under the title French Strategic and Tactical Bombardment Forces of World War I. This book was published by Scarecrow Press in 2007. Steve is a retired statistician and CIA analyst, analyst with extensive counter-narcotics experience in Latin America and Southeast Asia. Even among this distinguished audience, it is safe to say that he is the only person in this room with experience in harvesting opium poppy. You won't be hearing about that this morning. <laughs> Several warning, uh, warring nations produced propaganda postcards featuring Germany's superweapon, the Zeppelin. <clears throat> Using these illustrations, Steve tells us how this terror weapon was perceived by citizens of the nations at war. Please welcome Steve Sutton. Do I hit that button? This. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> At least I'm the only one in the room who will admit to harvesting opium poppy. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, I, a lot of you know uh, Ted Hoosier, who uh, is the secretary for the league. He lives out in out in Nebraska, and he was in the Washington area in December for the for the Menkoffs uh, party, their book signing party. Um, and uh, as part of that weekend, he stayed at my house, as part of that weekend we went up to um, one of the world's largest postcard shops up in, in northeastern Maryland. And, uh, and I ended up spending twice as much money on postcards as he did. Um, so I uh, didn't tell my wife that. Um, but uh, but I, I finally, I've been accumulating postcards relating to uh, World War I air raids. Um, including Zeppelin raids for a number of years, and, and that uh, those purchases finally put me over the top where I felt like I had enough that I could at least put together a talk on it. So between the ones that I purchased and a uh, number that I've, that I've taken from, uh, uh, from books on the subject, um, I was able to put enough to kind of give you a picture of uh, the Zeppelins uh, as seen through World War I postcards. Um, some of them are actually, um, could be called fine art, uh, like this particular one here. Um, a lot of them are cartoons and propaganda and so on and are a bit cruder, but some of them are quite nice. So where we're going, uh, we're going to start, start first by talking about German postcards, um, uh, how they are uh, uh, a source of, of propaganda and, and uh, national pride. Um, propaganda kind of runs through all of this sort of subtly, um, even among the French and, and British postcards. Um, they sort of have a propagandistic message, even if they're not official government publications, um, simply because that was the, the attitude at the time. Uh, we're going to talk about French postcards, um, and these show things like outrage at the, at the damage caused by the Zeppelin raids. Um, there are a lot of postcards of, of Zeppelins and actually airplanes, um, which I don't have with me, uh, that show crashed German Zeppelins, crashed German airplanes, um, getting their just desserts. And then there are a few French postcards that, that are, are uh, intentional and humorous. Uh, we'll finish up with British postcards. Again, we've got a few scenes of outrage. We have a lot of, of um, scenes of of fascination with the Zeppelins um, as, they, as they went over England, uh, and then a number that, that have sort of the theme of fiery revenge, um, and, uh, and then the humorous ones, particularly ones where they're mocking the Hun. So German postcards. Um, this one um, is, has got a, a patriotic message from the Kaiser, delivered on the 1st of August 1914, 
and it's not really about zeppelins, but it's uh, the zeppelin is, is very prominent, um, kind of flying above a, a village on the, on the Rhine River. And um, uh, it, it was really, this shows Germany's view that the Zeppelin was, as, as some authors have stated, Germany's hydrogen bomb. It was the one weapon they had that nobody else had. Um, so, uh, so the Zeppelin is, figured, is, is featured very prominently here. This is clearly, clearly propaganda. Um, other ones are maybe propagandistic. I'm kind of labeling them more national pride. They're a little of both. Um, but these show uh, Zeppelin's bombing Antwerp. Um, the bombing of Antwerp in the first two months of World War I was actually something that really horrified the civilized world because these airships were coming over. They were dropping bombs on civilians um, as well as on the forts around Antwerp. Uh, and so it was really something that, that was um, a real break with the past. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, the Germans, the Germans did celebrate this achievement of, uh, of being able to bomb Antwerp with, uh, with postcards. Um, there was, uh, the first raid was on the, on the night of the 24th and 25th of August, 1914. Um, and then there were several others, and, and at that point, the dates seemed to get a little fuzzy. In the research I've done, I really can't pin down when I, I know there were several other times from one German account that, that Zeppelins bombed, uh, uh, two different army Zeppelins bombed Antwerp. Uh, but the dates are kind of unclear. Um, Antwerp was also being shelled by artillery during these times, up until it was, it was captured by the Germans on the 10th of October, 1914. So it's a little unclear if, you, if there was an explosion in, in, in the street, whether it was due to a Zeppelin or Um, again, you, you've, got, you've got a nice picture of uh, showing a Zeppelin over, over Warsaw, um, uh, bombing the city of Warsaw before the, the Germans captured it. Um, and, you know, again, this is, this is actually pretty nice artwork. Um, and I was not able to find the dates, um, the dates for when Warsaw was bombed. Um, certainly, you know, 1914, maybe 1915. Um, but uh, uh, I, I was, despite the size of my library and looking diligently, I was not able to find exactly when it was bombed. This is actually a Shuttle Lance airship. They were similar to the Zeppelins, except they were made by a different company, and they had a wooden superstructure instead of an aluminum alloy superstructure. <coughs> um, this postcard shows an attack on Venice by Zeppelins and, uh, and navals, naval vessels. As far as I can tell, this never really happened. <laughs> um, I have found a number of references to um, Venice being bombed by Austrian planes, land planes, sea planes. Um, in fact, I, in Austria, I was even in a, in a museum that had um, Fragments of statues in a in a church that from a church that had been had been damaged by uh, by aerial bombs. But as far as I can tell, there was never any um, never any real attack simultaneous uh, by zeppelins on on the city of Venice. Um, so you know it's it's kind of kind of fanciful. Still, it's it's relatively nice art compared to what you're going to see coming up. Uh, this is a picture of the pre-war <coughs> Zeppelin, the, uh, the Navy's first Zeppelin, the L-1. Um, this one was, uh, was destroyed around, around the end of 1913, so it's, sort of, it's not really a, a wartime, uh, wartime Zeppelin, but it was, again, it, it shows the theme of national pride. This one, I think, is a reprint, not based on what I see on the front, but what's, what's on the back of it. Uh, it doesn't look like it's a, it's a contemporary doesn't look like it's a World War I era postcard. It looks like it's a little late. <clears throat> um, you have the Sanka cards that everyone knows about for the Aces. They also made them for Zeppelin commanders. Um, 
This one is of, um, of the Naval Commander Fran Sabert, who was uh, who uh, commanded the Naval Zeppelins L-20 and L-44. Um, I didn't label what this one really was because it's it's sort of um, I don't know in mourning. Uh, it's uh, uh, I got this one from a book. It's our it's our fallen Zeppelin heroes. Um, starting in September 1916, um, the British finally developed incendiary and explosive machine gun bullets, and they started shooting down the Zeppelins um, with with very little difficulty. And so, at some point after that, you've got uh, you've got three airship commanders. Two of, two of them died in, in, in such, uh, such attacks. Um, so they're commemorating those three. After September 1916, when the British were able to finally start shooting them down, um, then, uh, then really the Zeppelins were a greater danger to their own crews flying over blacked out England than they were to the, uh, to the English populace. Okay, so this concludes uh, German postcards. Uh, we're moving on to French postcards now. Uh, generally, when you say French postcards, you don't think about Zeppelins. Uh, <coughs> Titillating item. Yes, yes, uh, literally. <coughs> um, French postcards had, uh, like, like the British ones we'll see soon, uh, there are a number that simply expressed outrage. Um, they showed damage um, from uh, Zeppelin attacks. Uh, this is one of the two Zeppelin raids on Paris. Um, and I was able to track down, uh, based on the information on, on the bottom, I was able to track down that this was, uh, this attack occur occurred on the night of 29 to 30 January 1916. Um, uh, Monsieur Debault and his mother-in-law were killed and his wife was wounded in this attack. Uh, 23 people were killed at all, um, and uh, and so it's it's pretty horrific. This is kind of a these these Zeppelin raid um, uh, scenes of damage are uh, something that were were a very <coughs> common theme in in French postcards. They showed not only Zeppelin raids but much more commonly damage from aerial from I'm sorry aerial uh, artillery bombardment and from uh, airplanes dropping bombs. So there's a lot of these around of different, of different themes. And the Zeppelin ones just seem to be one, one sort of subset of them. Again, from the uh, uh, area of outrage, uh, in the theme of outrage, this is again the Zeppelins over, over Paris. And this was actually a, um, um, a series that was published by this one company. And they keep saying over and over again, the Zeppelin raids over Paris, the odious crimes of the of the Bosch pirates. Um, this is showing a a, a a bomb that hit uh, right next to the street, and I'm not sure which of the two raids that is. Um, this one is also from the second raid. This is a reprint. Um, the uh, you can see the stamp is not in color, um, and uh, and so that's how you know it's a reprint. Um, also, it was cheaper. Um, but again, they're showing you know this damage um, and saying that seven people were killed in, in, in this particular house that was, that was hit. Um, it, this happened in more places than just Paris. Uh, in uh, uh, Rivigny, there's there's again damage from the Zeppelin from the sixth of March, nineteen sixteen. You know, and, and again, there's a lot of these postcards out there if you. At, at, if you go to postcard shops in, in Europe, uh, most of them are for artillery damage. But, but every once in a while, you get lucky and find an air raid one. Uh, and then they started the theme of after the outrage. They started the theme of the just desserts. Um, this shows the uh, Zeppelin L seventy seven that was shot down uh, by um, truck mounted artillery and aircraft artillery uh, on the twenty first of February nineteen sixteen. So there are a number of photographs of crashed Zeppelins uh, that made it into postcards. And in fact, also, there's a lot of crashed airplanes, German airplanes, uh, that made it into postcards. 
this is another one from the same incident, um, showing one of the Zeppelin crew in the foreground, um, clearly dead. Uh, and there were actually a lot of, based on, on what I've seen, there were actually a lot of these really gruesome photographs, um, particularly by the French, um, that made them in, made their way into, into postcards and, and books and things like that. Um, Here, this one's kind of interesting. This is um, this is showing the remains of a zeppelin that were put into um, uh, the French Museum of the Army, um, and this was the Army Zeppelin the Z8 uh, that was shot down on either the 21st or the 23rd of August 1914. Um, it's a little odd because I found multiple sources um, for each date, and I can't tell you which one is really true. Um, the, uh, this was actually a very important event early in the war because on this same day, nearby, the Army Zeppelin Z7 was also shot down. This was by ground fire. Um, they were using these Zeppelins, um, remember we're only like 20 days into the war, they're using these Zeppelins during the daytime um, as part of Army maneuvers. And uh, they found that they were quite vulnerable to um, uh, to ground fire. Uh, and so after they lost two Zeppelins in one day, they stopped using the Zeppelins at, um, during the day and then switched to, to only using them at night. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they had it, had it exhibited as a war trophy, and, and it made it its way into postcards. <coughs> Um, there's, I've got a couple that show humor uh, of, of French postcards. This one shows a, a Zeppelin trying to steal <coughs> it to triumph. Um, and uh, this is by the same company that does you know, the, the Zeppelins over Paris uh, series. Um, so it's kind of, kind of amusing. I was, I was quite pleased to find that because I'd seen nothing like it before. Another one that's that's um, uh, humorous. You've got the Zeppelin raid going on, and, and you've got the the, uh, the soldier and his and his girlfriend, and uh, he's he's cursing the the Zeppelins for interrupting. Um, so again, a rare one with uh, with humor in uh, in a French postcard. Okay, we're gonna move on to British postcards. This is what passes for risque in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is probably why French postcards are more famous than British <coughs> postcards. Um, you'll find some that, that also have the outrage theme. Um, this one is, is actually a reprint of a World War I postcard that I, uh, that got, I got in Hull from a, uh, uh, a Zeppelin raid on the city of Hull in, uh, in 1915. Um, and, uh, uh, you'll find a few like that that'll show bomb damage. Uh, there's a lot of pictures in in, um, in newspapers and so on at the time uh, that would show bomb damage. Um, they seem to do a few in postcards. <clears throat> but there's a whole huge series of once they started to shoot the Zeppelins down, um, this was a, a scene of real, uh, real interest uh, to the, uh, to the public, and it's fairly easy to find nice colored postcards that show, uh, uh, show images of, uh, uh, of Zeppelins being shot down. Um, they're not all in color, some are black and white, um, some are sort of cartoonish, um, but, it's, but there's, there's quite a few of those out there. There's also a lot that, ha that just sort of show the fascination with the whole thing. Um, when I was in, in the mid-90s, I went to the city of Hull. It's a, a port city on the, in, on the northeast coast. And I interviewed a number of people who had been children or teenagers during the Zeppelin raids. And one of the things I learned was that everybody saw one. Um, it, uh, it, was, it was a very common occurrence. And so there was kind of this fascination. And so you get a whole bunch of postcards that deal with um, with the air defense and uh, Zeppelins being overhead and stuff like that. The one on the on the left is uh, 
um, is a postcard that shows uh, the view from Hendon of all the searchlights above London. Um, and then you've got this one, it's a, a, a drawing of a, uh, of a Zeppelin caught in searchlights. There are also a number that purport to be um, photographs, um, kind of in the same theme of, of fascination with the Zeppelins being overhead. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of a source of debate whether all of these are, um, are real photographs or whether they're, 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 um, they're drawings. Um, it's a little hard to tell. This one, it's pretty clear, it's the same image from two different angles. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you can see the, the same chimneys and everything. And, uh, and this one might be a photograph. Um, but it's a stereograph? Beg your pardon? You think it might be a stereograph? No, I doubt it. I, I, don't, think, I don't think so. Um, you know, I never thought yes. of that. But they made so many, um, so many pictures <coughs> with, um, with the cameras with, with two lenses for mm -hmm. uh, stereopticons. You know, that's possible. I, I, I have never considered that. Um, They're certainly printed with different exposures, though. You notice that the, <coughs> the tree in the background and the uh, skyline and the, and the two are much different exposure. One's uh, much lighter than the other. Yeah, um, although, actually, I, I did mess condition. with the contrast on, on a lot of these so, so they would be easily visible. Also, your angle of incidence for the... Um, beams are different, and the angle of incidence for the zeppelin is also different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's but the uh, but those three highlights up there are the same relative positions. I don't know whether those are supposed to be reflection. Well, the I, lowest one. I, I think they're supposed to be anti-aircraft bursts. Yeah. Um, and I'm, the positioning being the same. Yeah. I suggest either it's a doctor. <laughs> yes. A photo, or yeah, or or two taken simultaneously, or like, like for a stereopticon, or a composited photo. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, there there are, there are some of these that claim to be photographs that I look at them and I think clearly they're not. You know, no Zeppelin of the nineteen sixteen era looked like that. Um, so you know, there are some these these I'm not quite sure whether they're real photos or not. Also, once you start getting Zeppelins being shot down, there's incredible hero worship of the few individuals who were, who were <coughs> able to shoot down uh, Zeppelins. On the left, you've got uh, William Leap Robinson of the Royal Flying Corps, who shot down the SL-11 um, over uh, Cuffley, just north of London, uh, something that was seen by million, literally millions of people, uh, you know, this, this, this airship falling in, uh, in flames in the, in the sky. Um, you know, there was just, I mean, talk about rock stars. Um, you know, he probably never paid for a drink again in his life. Um, but I mean, they're really idolizing, uh, really idolizing him. Okay, the one on the left is also an indication of, of hero worship. I don't know if you can read that, but, but the lady is saying, neither Jack nor Tommy, in other words, neither sailor nor soldier, can, can my, whole, my whole affections win because I love the flying man who bombs the Zeppelin. <laughs> um, when um, uh, when uh, uh, Lieutenant Warneford downed a Zeppelin over Belgium, he did it by flying above it and dropping a bomb on it. He did not have available the... Um, didn't have available yet um, incendiary and explosive machine gun bullets. And when the, when the first airship was shot down by over England by Robinson, the British government didn't say that it was shot down with bullets. They just left that blank because they didn't want the Germans to know the weapons they had. And so they allowed people to assume that this, that the um, the airship that uh, that Robinson shot down was also hit by a bomb from above, and so hence you get you get that uh, uh, 
that postcard. Um, so these are, you know, that's sort of on the verge of humorous. This one is definitely supposed to be humorous. The one on the right, uh, you've got this sort of scruffy looking soldier saying, let not invasion scares or bombs from Zeppelins drive you balmy. There's naught can harm old Britain now, for I have joined the army. The postcard on the left, which I, I, had, a, I had a terrible image to copy um, in, in the book, but it's actually one of my favorite because it's so, it's, it's, uh, so clever. It's, it shows a Zeppelin, and it's got bombs exploding around a chicken coop, and you've got, you've got roosters running, and it's quoting a German official report that says, our gallant airmen successfully bombed a huge shell factory. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great stuff. Um, I really wish I had a better picture of it. Um, the one on the right, um, the gas bag, it's showing Kaiser Wilhelm as a, as a Zeppelin, um, which is also pretty clever. And, uh, and the song at the bottom is, O Ver, O Ver, is my big victory, O Ver, O Ver, can it be? You know, it's sort of mocking them because this, the airships haven't turned out to be the super weapon that they all thought they were. Um, the, uh, the idea of people... Uh, uh, making out during uh, during Zeppelin raids seems to be very popular. You had the one French, the one French humorous image before. You've got you've got two others of uh, of the same thing, uh, same general theme of uh, of uh, Zeppelins and, and assignations. And then just some other various things. The one on the bottom left. Um, you've got the dog hiding under the lady's skirt, saying, let the Zeppelins come, I don't care. Upper right, you've got the, the maid who's, uh, who's uh, blaming the Zeppelins for, uh, for breaking a plate, um, you know, because they're, they're spreading havoc all over the place. The one on the upper right, uh, upper left, I actually don't understand. Um, that's, that's the lady behind the screen uh, bathing, and she says, by gum, I, sh I should look soft if the Zeppelin came now. Any idea what that means? Not wrinkled. Not wrinkled. Ah, okay. All right. She's so standing in a tub of water. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. And then finally, we got a man sitting in a chair and a cat's purring above him. And uh, he says, Hark, I hear a Zeppelin. <laughs> So, um, any questions? Yes? Not a question, but a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I recently read, and now of course I forgot where I read it, but it could have been in over the front, uh, an article that when they invented the incendiary bullets and they went up, and still they couldn't get the airship down. Yes. And uh, what they had to do is they had to shoot first bullets that would make a big hole. Yes. So they were explosive bullets that would make a big <coughs> hole. And then they shot the incendiary ones. Um, I don't know if they did it in a different, having two machine guns. Uh, uh, no, they alternated the bullets. The alternating yes, bullets. Yes, yes. Um, and that was because they had a physical explanation. There was no oxygen uh, for the hydrogen to burn. Yes. So they needed to make a big hole so enough oxygen went in. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, they, needed, they needed to have the hydrogen mix with the oxygen and the, um, for it to ignite. S hence, they needed the big hole from the explosive bullet the big hole in the gas cell, and they needed the incendiary bullets to, to light it. Um, inside the, the gas cells, which, which were in the Zeppelin, um, you had, you've, got this, you've got this superstructure of uh, duralumin, an aluminum alloy, and you had something like a dozen, um, a dozen individual cells that held hydrogen. Often, the air pressure of the hydrogen inside the cells was lower than the air pressure outside. And so they would tend not to leak, even if they had a machine gun bullet go through them. Hence, they really needed to, to make a big hole so you would get a mixture of the hydrogen. There, there's also the, the issue of fuse sensitivity for a lot of 
other bullets who just, even if they had an explosive warhead, could just pass right through the canvas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or yes. the material yeah. they were, were using and uh, just not, not set off the bullet because there wasn't enough uh, pressure. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. I'm talking about the, I guess called the celebratory aspects. There's, I forget the, the occasion, but on one occasion, a London crowd actually broke out singing Land of Hope and Glory as they were watching his Zeppelin slowly fall to oh, yeah? flames. And um, there's a story, like an adjunct to the Foresight Saga, called Soames and the Flag, in which he expresses disgust at people celebrating the Zeppelin going down in mm -hmm. flames. He doesn't have much love for the Germans, and he knows that the poor devils in the ship are being burned alive. Yeah. Yeah. But you talk about the fascination that they, particularly the Royal Navy, went over the wreckage with, with a fine tooth comb of every Zeppelin that came down, getting as much information as they could from them. Yes. And, uh, and on one occasion, they, a German speaking British officer actually went undercover and shared a, a hospital room with a captured Zeppelin crew member, hoping to pick up any scrap of information from it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, there was, um, there was an article by uh, the late Douglas Robinson. In over the front a number of years back on uh, on Zeppelin intelligence, um, the use of intelligence by the Zeppelin crews to do their mission and the use of intelligence by the British to try to learn about them, um, and also effectively they they um, they reverse engineered a Zeppelin um, because they were the British were the first one with one of their their R airships I think it was R thirty four perhaps to fly. Uh, fly the Atlantic yeah. um, right after the war. I think it was 1919, yeah. um, and uh, and they basically were able to construct a zeppelin, uh, or able to construct an airship because they copied um, what they found on the ground from from multiple zeppelins falling. Well, the Shenandoah was based on a German design that they brought down over. Yes. They added yes. an extra section to, to, to compensate for helium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Steve, I've always wondered, mm -hmm. um, does, when you were trying to shoot down a Zeppelin, you had to penetrate the outer shell and then get into the gas bag, right? Yes, although the outer shell is, is, is actually just fabric right. um, yeah. around, around a superstructure. So there was how much of the interior of the Zeppelin, approximately, there's all this air in Inside the Zeppelin, right between the gas bags and the outer fabric. So, how much of it was gas bag, and how much of it was, you know, between the gas bags and the outer? Um, I'm I'm going to say maybe at least seventy five percent, because certainly there was area there was areas um, inside the Zeppelin fuselage below the gas bags yeah. um, where people could walk. They had a they had a catwalk. Um, it's where they stored the bombs, um, and uh, and so I'm guessing at least 75 percent of the area inside the Zeppelin fuselage was probably taken up by the gas cells, maybe more. Steve, yeah. Uh, regarding the postcards, it looks from what you've illustrated here today that. The height of it was between 1914 and 1916 of the cards of the propaganda nature. Mm -hmm. um, and how far along in your research of this did the production of these cards extend to up to what year? And then was there a peak in German cards, peak in French cards, peak in <coughs> British cards? that you can attribute to, you know, in response of? Um, often I don't know when the cards were produced. Sometimes I know when they were mailed. Um, but I don't know when they were produced. Um, I, I think certainly they were, they, were, they were not being used for propaganda after late 1916 when, when the British started knocking them out of the air. Um, it was just, you know, they weren't really accomplishing much of anything. And, and, and the Germans had much more to, to focus on. They had, they, had, they had the aces, for example, and, and things like that. Um, as far as the, yeah, I, I, I guess that, that's about, 
about the best I can say. I, I think you're absolutely right that really the heyday of the Zeppelin cards, um, perhaps for um, uh, perhaps for all the countries, was really 1914 through the end of 1916. Um, by 1917, the German army gave up all of their Zeppelins and just turned them over to the Navy, the ones they had left, um, because they weren't they didn't do well in terms of reconnaissance or, or, or uh, battlefield bombing. The, the amount of bombs they could carry compared to an artillery battery's uh, capacity was, was uh, trivial. Um, and they certainly didn't work during the day, as they found out in, in the first month of the war. Um, so I, I think you're probably right that really the heyday of it for, for everybody was, uh, uh, was through 1916. Uh, there are some of these cards I know that were sent in 1917, but I don't know when they were when they were created. So, yeah. What did you think of the re uh, recent um, special on um, public TV on the Zeppelin raids? I loved it. I I um. It, it was a very different. It was it was a scientific view of it, and um, uh, and I found that even though I've been studying these for years. I've interviewed people who were in the Zeppelin raids. I've walked the path of Zeppelin flights as they bombed London and Hull. Um, I've really immersed myself in it, and I still learn stuff that I didn't I didn't know. Um, there was the the only thing I really really thought was was sort of cheesy was they kept referring to certain things as mysteries that you know are not mysteries. Um, you know things things that are, are well known to to researchers and and so on, and they would call them mysteries for the for the sake of TV. That was a little over dramatic, um, but I really like their experimental look at history. I, I thought that was very cool. I was also very pleased I, when you see when you see documentaries and things on Zeppelins, they always recycle the same few images from the movie Hell's Angels in the 30s. Time and time again, you see that. And this didn't. They created their own, you know, computer-generated graphics um, to illustrate what the Zeppelins were doing. They showed scenes from the movie, and they illustrated it as such. You know, this is from the Hell's Angel movie. Um, and so it was very honest from a historical standpoint. Um, so um, so I, I really liked it. I, I, I had an email exchange with uh, Jim Streckfuss um, in which we, we disagreed on it. He, he really wanted more of a historical approach, and uh, um, and I, I, I guess I, I viewed history a little a little more differently than than he does. I, I think anything that you can do that can sh gain in, shed insights on on history is is just as valid as, as stuff that a historian gets from a you know from an archives with great sources. So. Yes, Ted. Yeah. There's a new graphic that's. Um was installed in downtown World War I gallery. It shows a cover from a, I think it's 1909, issue of Judge Magazine. And it shows John Bull standing astride uh, Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And he's holding a number of uh, kind of leash lines to ships that mm -hmm. surround uh, Great Britain. And he's looking up in the air because what he sees are aircraft uh, in the form of Zeppelin-like uh, mm -hmm. aircraft. The date suggests that the fear component was being introduced much earlier than 1914. Yes. And I wonder if there are any postcards or much more public awareness in uh, particularly Britain, um, perhaps France as well, maybe Russia, about um, the fear of the coming war and attack from above mm -hmm. from Zeppelin-like aircraft. Have you seen any, much evidence of that? I have not seen it in postcards, but I've seen it in posters, um, both in terms of, of uh, German posters and illustrations that might be in magazines, say, um, that, that make it clear that, that the Germans see the Zeppelins as their super weapon um, and that they can reach out and touch the British anytime they want. Um, and you also see um, uh, 
illustrations of of Britain being concerned about um, being concerned about the tax by airships. Um, so I haven't seen it in postcards, but I have seen it in other illustrations. Um, the United States was worried about Zeppelin raids on American forts, or airship raids, I'll be more precise, airship raids on American forts uh, on the East Coast as early as 1908. There were people in the U.S. Army who were talking about this possible threat. Um, and so it was, uh, it, it was something that was out there. There was also a period um, shortly before the First World War, maybe, I don't remember the date, but it was, say, within two years of, of, of World War I beginning, where um, there were a lot of Zeppelin sightings in Britain. You know, like, like sometimes you'll get waves of UFO sightings. Um, they were, there was actually a wave of UFO sightings of, uh, of Zeppelins in Britain because of anxiety about this. And the Zeppelins weren't there. Um, you know, it's just kind of, kind of a, an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there were definite, definite concerns, especially because there was so much literature um, in the years leading up to World War I, um, certainly in Britain, about the next war. You know, sometimes, sometimes the authors would, and it was, it was actually a, 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 quite a cottage industry. There were a lot of authors writing, you know, cheap novels about, about the next war and how, you know, suddenly all of the, all of the German waiters in London, you know, are going to turn into an army and, and, uh, um, and, and, you know, take over. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the book, The Riddle of the Sands, uh, which was yeah. which was since made into a movie, and the Riddle of, Sa of the Sands is still in print. It was something like 1908, 1910. Something about that, yeah. That was when it was written, and it was and it was all about the you know the coming German invasion. It had nothing to do with Zeppelins, but it was the coming German invasion. So there was a lot of this literature out there. Sometimes it was the Germans invading. Sometimes it was the French. Um, you know, the sneaky French were coming across in a tunnel built under the uh, under the channel, according to one of the one of these novels. And so there was a lot of that kind of feeling out there um, in the years leading up to World War I. There's a really good book on the subject by Alfred Golan uh, about the airship scare of 1909, The Phantom. Uh, ah, thank you. And uh, I recommend it uh, as reading because it, it covers the whole topic and this is in response to the Wright brothers, a success of flying, and that England is no longer an island. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the, the name of the book Probably is... Probably brought home by Blario's flight. Right. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. And, and then in 1909, and then the airship scare, because they know about the Zeppelin. And so it relates to all three aspects of it. The book is... Really, uh, a great What's academic. The title, Carl? No longer an island. I'll send you the the citation on it. But if you do a Google search on it called "No Longer an Island," you'll see Alfred Cohen and there's an article and some reviews and some uh, good material on it. Recommended highly. Yeah, it, it shows up in some of the Tom Swift, some of the original Tom Swift mm -hmm. books too. So sure, sure. Is, is airship, is aerial warship, and the like. Uh, curious, did you have you? Started going into the uh, German naval archives over at NARA on some of these, or looking for more on these. On, um, <laughs> on this past Wednesday, I took my first German class. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the plan is, the plan is at some point. I mean, I've I've been taking French for four yeah. years, and I I can do really well with French records. And so sometime in the next few years, I should be able to tackle something like that. And and it and it definitely interests me. Yeah. Um, but I'm not there yet. Um, in, in fact, I, I, I pestered my, my German teacher on, um, af after my very first class by handing her that, that first postcard and saying, can you tell me what this says? I've got to give a talk on Saturday and I don't know what it says. <laughs> so, Brilliant. All right, well, thank actually, you. Actually, Carl, remember... Is that, is that the, uh,